Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much indeed for joining us uh, for today's um, uh, webinar on redefining the local news crisis. This is a series that we've been doing over the past few weeks at the Tau Centre. Uh, my name is Emily Bell. I'm director of the Tau Centre. And I'm really, really pleased um, to be joined by uh, the panel we have today on a subject that um, has been central to our research this year. Um, and which I think is growing in both uh, profile and importance, and that's the issue of um, politicization uh, in local news. Um, for those of you who haven't been following, uh, there, are, uh, there is a trend, um, I'm not going to put it any more st strongly than that, um, that sees uh, the format and presentation uh, of local news now being used by uh, networks which are either explicitly or implicitly political. Um, we've done a lot of research at the Tower Center into uh, one or two of these networks. We've been tracing something called the uh, Metric Media, which is, presents itself as the fastest growing local news network in uh, America. Um, but there's also a rich history of political involvement in the ownership of local news. Uh, and the question is, you know, how should we view these new, new phenomena? Um, are they really new? How are they different from the other influences that we have in local news at the moment? And I think critically, as advertising recedes from local news and other types of funding appears, um, how much of a problem uh, or perhaps an opportunity uh, is this? So uh, joining me to discuss that, um, the, discuss that issue are uh, my colleague, Michael Shudson, who's um, an eminent sociologist in, in news, who's gonna frame out the uh, historical context for us. Uh, we have Sue Cross, uh, welcome Sue, who's actually got to, she's opening her own um, uh, day of uh, activities for the um, Institute for Nonprofit News at one o'clock, so we may lose her a little earlier, but I'm really grateful that Sue can be here because uh, she's a real authority on thinking about what independence in news means and how we draw those definitions. And then I'm really, really grateful to Chris uh, Fitzsimon, uh, who is the publisher and CEO of States Newsroom, which is a project uh, that uh, Chris founded, in fact, um, that looks at, uh, that, 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 that puts state house reporters um, into, um, in, into, it seeks to put state house reporters into most of the state houses in the US. Uh, the network um, does receive uh, political funding, I believe, um, but Chris would not define uh, State's Newsroom as being the same type of organization as Metric Media um, and other uh, what we might call partisan funded networks. So um, it's been really hard for us to get uh, participants um, from those groups to come and discuss the issue. Uh, so Chris, we, I want to acknowledge the fact that you, you put your hand up and said you would be happy to do it. Uh, I'm happy to, but I, I will point out and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, address this later. We actually don't receive political funding, but we can right. get to that okay. as we continue the discussion. I think there's been a lot of misinformation about that. I'm happy to be here to clear it up. Fine. That's great. Well, I was going to say, sorry for spreading in for misinformation right at the top of the session. Um, but it's it, it, exactly this, which is sort of putting into context why some of these entities are different, but why they might not be regarded as strictly speaking independent. So I think those are issues. I want to come to Michael first. Uh, Michael, um, you very kindly uh, agreed to come on this, having said, I know nothing about this phenomenon that you're, you're describing, but um, actually you know a huge amount about it because you know the, the deep history of it. So I wanted you to just kick us off with um, a framing of, 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 of what that political involvement and how it's been influential on uh, American news um, over the past couple of uh, centuries. Very good. Um, I will try to do that. Um, uh, as I understand um, from what I've uh, read in the, since you invited me uh, to this, uh, the, the trend that uh, we're talking about here and we're concerned about is local news or networks of local news um, that are um, sometimes apparently um, partisan uh, or ideological without necessarily announcing that, uh, that they uh, put their news content very often together 
uh, as cheaply as possible. That is using materials um, gathered and reported and published by others and hiring few, if any, journalists. Um, uh, and that there, th this is a peculiar kind of, of localness. Um, so what I want to say is that we've seen elements of this before in American history uh, for a long time, in fact, uh, which is not to deny that the current um, uh, developments may be of special concern um, and uh, may present a, a danger to um, um, good information circling uh, uh, and circulating in the country uh, at the local level. Um, but if it's any consolation, um, these features uh, that we see today have existed in other forms in the past. Um, and I want to talk about three. Um, uh, local, that is local uh, journalism without journalists, um, strident partisanship, and locally inflected information without anything we would call local reporting. Um, so I want to talk about each of those three things. First, um, journalism without journalists. Um, this can be traced back to the Postal Act of 1792. It, it existed before, but the Postal Act of 1792 institutionalized it. It established the U.S. postal system, which enabled newspapers to circulate um, with, through the mails at lower rates per weight than letters. Or, ordinary correspondence. Um, and it enabled newspapers to be mailed to other newspapers free of charge. Um, these exchange papers were then available to editors and they reprinted freely from the exchange papers that made up a large share of the total news content of many, probably most local newspapers. Uh, this was a kind of entirely informal blend of something like the AP, and something like syndicated columns, but no money changed hands and quite possibly no journalists were at any point involved. If a London paper or a New York paper printed say a, a European monarch's declaration of war or announcement of the marriage of the prince to the princess of some other dynasty, um, that would require only a printer in London or New York to put the announcement in the paper and then the editor who received exchange paper, usually from a New York paper, in Columbus, Ohio, or Great Barrington, Massachusetts, reprinted it. Uh, no journalist, as we would think of journalists, anywhere to be found in that entire operation. So that, that was standard practice. Um, that's how most newspapers throughout the country in the 1800s, uh, well into the late latter part of the 19th century, provided content for their readers. The second point to make is that the press through most of the 19th century um, was partisan, explicitly so. Uh, the founders, the US um, founding fathers, thought that parties and partisanship were the bane of political existence and they urged that organized parties not be established. They feared such establishment. Um, what they called faction. Uh, but in practice, once the country was underway, the founders often covertly helped partisan newspapers survive, um, sometimes by writing for them uh, under pseudonyms. But they were not keen on, on that practice, uh, theoretically. Um, you all know that uh, Thomas Jefferson declared he would rather have newspapers without a government than a government without newspapers. Uh, less widely known, he also wrote once he became president, that the man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them, uh, inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehood and errors. He urged, in fact, that newspapers be divided into four sections, truths, probabilities, possibilities, and lies. Um, he just thought the first section would likely be very 
small. So one thing about the 19th century partisan press that distinguishes it from at least some of the, the, the new networks um, is that they boldly announced their partisanship. They did not insinuate it. That, that's what they were about. They were political agencies. Uh, they had close connections to political parties and they hoped their party would get into government because then they would have jobs. Um, even our most sainted presidents like Abraham Lincoln um, um, appointed many editors who supported him in his bid for office uh, as, to, as ambassadors and customs house directors and so on. The third point, um, here's a, what I find a very striking sentence from a, a detailed uh, account of local newspapers in the 19th century by historian David Russo. Um, Russo writes that it was only at about the middle of the 19th century that the content of town, small town newspapers came to have, and here's the, I quote him, came, the content of town papers came to have a significant relationship to the communities where they were printed. Even then, the local news was not political news. Partisan editors understood state and national news to be political and partisan, but local news was something else. Local news was community news. Local news was social solidarity building news. It, it was um, uh, get everyone's name into the newspaper news. And it was, um, again, often journalism without journalists. The news was what we would call user-generated content. Uh, in a study of uh, Kingston, New York, the local newspaper, which dated to the early 1800s, did not even mention local elections and did not begin to cover village government at all until 1845. While there were elections, they were generally without issues. If there was campaigning, no one reading the local papers in the 1820s or 1830s would ever have known. Why then were European visitors so impressed with the presence of newspapers everywhere they went in America? Um, well, they, they weren't wrong. There were a lot of newspapers, uh, many more per capita <laughs> than anywhere in Europe, um, but not because a population demanded them, but because the existence of a newspaper might attract a population. There were more newspapers than anybody demanded, just as there were also more small colleges than anybody could possibly use and more grand hotels in very small towns, all begun in hopes of attracting future growth. They boasted of the great soil for agriculture, the commerce-minded city fathers of the college, the hotel, and of course the newspaper. Newspaper's strongest ideology at the local level was boosterism, the commitment to promote local economic growth. Even more precisely in many cases, newspapers were real estate ventures. Uh, in Milwaukee, the two leading newspapers were established in 1836 and 1837 by the leading landowners on either side of the Milwaukee River. Each man was eager to promote the young settlement, especially uh, talking of in the paper of the advantages of his side of the river. But to conclude from this, that most of what American journalists are, I think, justly proud of is the strength of news organizations that became professional organizations and supported professionalism as it emerged in the 20th century and not earlier. I think there's much in contemporary journalism to respect and to admire and sometimes to take my breath away uh, by the, the skill and courage that it requires and demonstrates, but it's not a longstanding tradition. Basic news practices like interviewing date only to the late 19th century, Basic news ethics and a quest for objectivity, however quixotic that, that quest may be, date to the 1920s, and strong organizational commitment to contextualizing news stories rather than being satisfied with he said, she said, date really to the 1970s and not before. Um, th whatever this new uh, set of trends is, um, it's, it's as a kind of pseudo local journalism. It's a throwback of a sort to journalism that we might wish had disappeared.
Michael, that's very eloquent and thank you. That's a, just a great, as I say, sort of framing that we, we tend to meet these issues as journalists as like everything is new all the time. So it's a fantastic reminder to, 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 to really sort of pass that out for us. Sue, um, coming to you, uh, so, 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 so this is not necessarily a new phenomenon, yet it's showing up in sort of very new ways. Can, can you tell us how um, at the INN you, you view this? And we've had conversations about this mm -hmm. before where you said, you know, this is actually kind of like a significant and growing phenomenon from, from your perspective. Can you, can you describe what it looks like and what kind of actors we're dealing with? Yes, it is. My perspective um, that I'll share is coming from working with nonprofit newspapers. And so there is a, a definition there, 501c3 is under the US tax law. And the reason that matters here is that the IRS actually forbids 501c3 entities from being partisan. Now, in the IRS definition, that's a very narrow definition. It is you cannot take part in any um, election or take a side or do, in our case, news coverage that would benefit one side or another in any election where there is a candidate. Um, and that's how the IRS in this context defines partisanship. So nonprofit news outlets don't do something that is a hallmark of many local as well as national newspapers, which is endorsing candidates. Um, that doesn't mean they don't cover politics. They certainly do, but they, they, they publish election guides but they're very even handed um, and, and they need to be to continue to be um, nonprofits. And that's designed to protect the consumer so that the consumer isn't giving a, to a charity that really is working explicitly or implicitly to bring about a change in government or be politically active. So just that framing so you understand in the, in the nonprofit world. That said, um, we see journalism changing and because nonprofits are growing, I think it tends to um, surface a lot of these issues or kind of exist at the cutting edge of some of them. So uh, many of our member publications that are part of INN have a clear point of view and a stated point of view. The Marshall Project, which covered, that's national, not local, but there are local um, equivalents you know, they believe the criminal justice system is um, in need of reform. It's fair to say that, and that's their point of view, but they are not out advocating for specific reforms. So we are seeing this huge gray area between journalism and advocacy, and some of that is progressive or conservative. Some of it is much more ideological or issue-based. The majority, I would say, is issue-based because of those IRS partisanship limits. But you definitely are seeing an evolution of news from um, this kind of voice of God view, uh, the, the kind of, if you think of, imagine Walter Cronkite's voice going back a ways or this a very even handed neutral voice to a voice that has a point of view. Um, what we are seeing is to a, a kind of division and to speak to partisanship. We don't necessarily see partisanship as a problem. It, it, it is in this non, nonprofit world. Um, but as long as it's explicit in those, those distinctions you drew in your introduction and that my culture as well, if something has an, an, you know, an elephant or a donkey splashed on the front page or a value statement that says, we're, we cover news from a progressive lens, or we, here is our point of view. We think if it's explicit, um, that's the key thing. The issue is transparency, and so the reader knows where this publication is coming from. The ones that concern us, including those that you mentioned, there's been this swath of, of startups um, that just say, no, we're not partisan. We just happen to only be in swing states. <laughs> and um, people take varying views on their content analysis, which I haven't done, but people have said, you know, if you watch them over time, you will see that. I would note that when there is partisanship and it's not explicit, it often takes a long time to watch it. 
um, or some deep digging to detect it. And this is where I think we really get into a dangerous area that is different from the old days when partisanship was the norm. It's this, this kind of underground um, point of view masquerading as objective journalism where I think we get into trouble. And I'll, I'll give you two examples. There was an organization that came to us, um, I wanna say three or four years ago. They had entirely um, anonymous funding. They were producing a lot of good content. They distributed it very heavily to African-American newspapers. And they applied for membership and we looked at them. They had, and they said, no, it's just our funders want to be anonymous. And, and they did not become a member of INN because of that. But I watched their content. I subscribed to them for a long time. A lot of the coverage was great. It was fine. But over time, you could see patterns of stories. Um, in that case, a lot of positive stories about the coal industry and a lot of stories uh, portraying um, new forms of energy as, as having a racist impact in, in disadvantaging communities um, because of tax policy to fund them and so forth. You had to read them for probably three or four months to pick up on the pattern, I would say. Was that ideological? I think so. I don't know for sure, but the pattern was pretty clear to me. The second example I'll give you um, this year came from within our world. We had several members that were approached by a major, major funder, tech money initially, approached news organizations across the country offering big grant funding for coverage of the big issues of our day, right? Education, health care, environment, hands off, no editorial impact, no, no, no review, complete editorial independence. So, on the surface, that sounds great. That sounds fine. Everyone has editorial um, independence policies. It's clear cut. But then what if I told you that that funding was that the, all the organizations reached were only in presidential swing states and that the topics to be covered while they are the big issues of the day are also the hot button issues that can be expected to sway voters um, in the coming presidential election. And we know that news coverage of an issue doesn't have to be partisan. It can raise perceptions that something is an issue, that it's a big deal. It can change how voters vote just by elevating something as an issue. And then finally, that funder insisted on anonymity. Now, if you started looking at that and saying, okay, you know, where you started, it looked fine. Once you dug into it, and if you also knew that this funder, if you look, they were very active on one side of the um, political aisle in the rest of their life, it appeared that this funding was probably intended as partisan funding. So you really have to dig into these things. They're not sitting there on the surface. If they're sitting there on the surface, I think that's, the public is smart, we can trust readers, they can make their own decisions on whether they think something is partisan or not. When it's not out there, that's when we get into, into trouble and why I think part of this current trend is not just a throwback. If it was just a throwback and we had partisan media and people know it's partisan, that could be part of the mix. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a big problem. And that, and that sort of extends to some extent beyond the categorizations of organizations like the INN. Um, so it extends into how do platforms see and deal with yeah. and distribute this. So one of the things we found in analyzing stories from a network called Metric, Met, Metric Media is that, you know, there'll be 450,000 stories put out over three months. And as you say, Sue, so, <laughs> It's not that these are meant to be read as a whole necessarily or address one community. It's more right. about what are you looking at? What's, what's the pattern? So, so kind of what's, you know, what would, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit here, Sue, because I'm coming to Chris next and saying, you know, what happens with the hard cases? And I'd like to sort of posit State's newsroom as a hard case because everybody I speak, speak to says they do great journalism. You know, mm -hmm. they actually have, they have a bona fide journalist and they're doing good work. And yet they found themselves lumped into, and Chris, you know, you'll have your, your, your chance to kind of argue against this. They find, find themselves put together with 
um, other organizations like Metric Media and like Korean Newsroom, which also employs real journalists and breaks real, break real stories. Um, why, is, why is States Newsroom, do you think, such a hard case? Um, I think it's a hard case any time you're not disclosing funding, particularly in nonprofit media, which has a tax break to provide something as a public service and does have this partisanship guideline. So to me, um, they are doing, a, I, I don't, read all of the state's newsrooms. Um, some people in some states feel that they are somewhat partisan or have a point of view in many other states. People have told me it's very even handed and they hired, Chris has hired top notch journalists, very good coverage. Um, it's the same issue I have with other organizations that if the funding isn't out there to the reader, then I think there is a question mark um, and always will be a question mark whether their coverage is even handed or not. So to me, the issue around that isn't the quality of coverage. There is a whole platform issue and then platforms are surfacing partisan content, crap content, <laughs> as well as good content, but that's a whole other issue. In the, in the case of transparency in funding, I just have never seen a good reason not to be transparent. Um, our members often run into this. Donors want to be private, and we understand that, right? And and um, some will even it, it post as the the donor rights. But when we think when it comes to news, the competing value to be open and transparent is just absolutely critical. And when we look. There, there are two things that uh, there's been very limited research, I would say, on this, but there have, have been several things. Knight has done an American Views survey for a number of years that goes out to the public and says, what do you think about these aspects of news? And in those findings two years ago and again in 2020, the public very strongly questions media bias and if the media is biased versus being an even-handed nonpartisan source of news. That doubt is higher among Republicans than Democrats, but it's there across and you're seeing it in this polarization. So there is something that the American public looks at and says, is this even-handed or not? Um, and then you also will see a great deal of research by the Trust Project, which is a, a project working with about 200 news sites so far and many more, I believe, over time to build news sites that increase public trust between the media and the public. And that's really important, we think, to do over time. Um, and the Trust Project has done research and they find that when you disclose your funding, as well as many other aspects about your organization, um, that increases public trust. The tr people are like, okay, I know where you're coming from. I know who funds you. And there are benefits, there are public benefits to that. So that's why we think that is so important um, in just creating a healthy, new relationship with the public in the news world. Right. I just want to, I just, so I want to put in, put pin in that and then come to Chris. Uh, so um, a couple of things, Chris, you know, um, I'll, I'll ask you just to address that, that question about funding. You know, if you go, if you go to your, your, your website um, and you read uh, biographies, including your own, you know, you, you, you worked for uh, uh, Speaker Dan Blue for a while, you know, it's clear that there are, um, ties to, you know, a particularly progressive view among people on the staff. You're not trying to hide that. Uh, so, so why, again, you know, kind of a, just, just talk me through the, 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 the founding of States Newsroom um, and why this sort of funding issue is something which has seen you categorized with, 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 with groups that you say we, we actually don't belong in that category, but that yet as we heard from Sue, you know, perhaps more transparency would allow uh, readers to, to draw their own conclusions rather more clearly. Sure, and thanks for the opportunity to clear up a lot of things. First of all, we do disclose our funding. If you go to our website and our about page, every donor that's given us more than $500 is currently listed. That was a policy when we became our own 501c3 organization last summer. We started operating independently in November, 
and we, we our policy has evolved and we knew we were going to be doing this. So now you can see who gives us money over $500. That's the first thing. The second thing is I think the confusion came. We were incubated in an organization called the Hopewell Fund, which is used by political groups, non-political groups, the Knight Foundation, Hewlett, Ford, a lot of foundations have invested in projects there because they give you a business background and support and HR when you're getting off the ground. We thought the important thing was to do the journalism first and evolve our process. Now we do those things in-house. We are completely independent and separate from Hopewell. All our donors, as I mentioned, above $500 are listed. We were founded. I, I was, I did work for the Democratic Speaker of the House, but our but most of our staff are two national editors. Uh, one worked for McClatchy for 32 years, is not a political person. Our other national editor was with the Tom Spica Union. Uh, in New Orleans, part of their Pulitzer Prize winning uh, coverage of Katrina, as is one of our national editors. Um, we have, uh, we've won 240 awards now in our, in states around the country, bought from our peers, from press associations, we're credentialed. We are real journalists doing the real work. The whole idea of state's newsroom is that state government and politics, when you consider how little it's covered and the shrinking coverage and how much impact it has on people's lives, we really believe it's sort of the nexus of what's happening to our democracy, which is people don't have information. They need to make decisions about their lives. And our goal is to present them hard hitting, relentless reporting every day from their capital and commentary, which is left of center or liberal commentary, just like the Washington Post or the New York Times. So uh, we believe in a strong, robust editorial page, but we clearly label what's commentary and what is news. Uh, and I would, I think that most readers in our, uh, our states and our, our, our trust our staff. Kathy Obradovich runs the Iowa Capitol Dispatch, was with the Des Moines Register for some 30 years, is one of the most respected journalists there. Uh, I could go on and on uh, about our staff and who they are. I think we have seven Pulitzer Prize winners or finalists. Mm -hmm. Our job is to, is to increase the quantity and quality of news in state houses. We're in 18 states. We have some 80 journalists that now we support with benefits and support from a, a headquarters office and a, we have a Washington bureau that covers congressional delegations. So I, in, in some ways we're more analogous to a, an old style newspaper chain where we're the publisher and we provide editorial support and guidance, but there's a lot of editorial independence in our state capitals. Uh, you know, we publish a hundred stories a day, sometimes more. Uh, and most of all of it is, is about what's happening in state government and politics and some local governments that affect people's lives. That's really the the reason we exist, and I, I do, I do uh, wish that we hadn't been lumped in with the partisan or ideological media because I think it's created some misperceptions. But I ask us, I ask people every day, judge us by our journalism and our journalists, and I think you'll find uh, that we are um, well-respected members of the press corps in the states that we're in. Um, our last, one of our last outlet was the Tennessee Lookout, where the reporter of the year from the Tennessee and is now our senior reporter, Anita Wadwani, who does amazing work. So. I think we mentioned before we went on the air, the Neiman Foundation initially wrote a story lumping us in with uh, the Courier newsrooms and then after further consideration and communication with us, concluded that we are not part of the partisan uh, media, that we're a, a, a respected news outlet and that's what we seek to be. We're trying to complement and supplement what's already out there, but we do think there's a shortage of information, especially in the state house about state government, about governors, about what's happening to people's lives. Do you think, um, so, so, so when you talk about being lumped in with, there are things out there that I'm sure people have read, like the um, opensecrets.org did a, a map of the progressive news organizations and how they're funded and states news and sort of crops up on that. Um, and, you know, we do see, as, as, as Sue was saying, also kind of single issue lobbyists now launching news organizations. And I think a lot of it, you know, it comes back to this, um, there was a, a leaked memo from um, a PAC uh, associated organization acronym um, earlier this year, which said, you know, the number one way to gain the trust of the public is through uh, local news, it's through local news outlets and um, acronym subsequently launched, although that they were behind the Korean newsroom, mm -hmm. which, you know, again, Korea does some good work. Um, it, 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 it perhaps kind of presents itself as non-partisan when in fact it's, it clearly does have partisan roots. But do you welcome, um, you know, you say you don't want to be lumped in with those people. Do you, do you, do you actually think, you know, it's an, is it a non-issue as, as, as political money moves into local news? Because um, I'm sure the acronym are not the only people, metric media are not the only people who've noticed that this actually could be a viable business model 
um, as advertising receipts to get special interests and, and political donors to put money into news. Um, do, you know, are we making too much kind of of an issue about this? I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're focused on our business model and we don't take political money and we're trying to report the news. I do think that surely we, are, we all, and I'm glad we're having webinars like this, we need to discuss uh, how politics and journalism intersect. And um, I noticed the Tau Center's research and the, that Neiman called on uh, in that report, I think found what 400 and some sites and I think all but eight were conservative. So there are these big conservative chains and that's an issue. But you know, I'm mostly here to talk about what state's newsroom does and why it's important and how we need more coverage at the state and local level. And I applaud the work INN does. We work, we have a relationship with some INN affiliates. We certainly work with them in capitals where they're located. Um, I think they're, uh, the problem in journalism isn't that there's too, uh, too many people trying to do good quality journalism. It is that there are too few and right. too many stories are going untold. And I think that's, the, that's why we exist, literally. Um, we're going to be launching a Missouri site uh, in a couple months and a Montana one. So we'll be in 20 states at the end of the year. So uh, I don't think anybody thinks those are swing states. Or, uh, so we're literally trying to get to as many as we can where we think there is a shortage of top flight quality state house reporting. Or there's just there's some and there could be more. I mean, the, the, you know, we can't have too much information. Do you actually notice, or do your reporters notice, and this is, this is a question, question for Sue as well, um, so one of the things that our research, uh, you know, we, we've noticed that there tend to be a kind of rash of similarly partisan um, outlets opening in certain places. You're, as you say, now in 20 states. Uh, as I say, you know, we're, we're, we're closely focusing on two or three of these networks as, as being a sort of a, a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, do your reporters notice this? You know, is this something that you're seeing at local level uh, and in the coverage of State House that there are more partisan, either local or kind of national networks? Um, I think we, uh, I can answer first. I think we, there are places where we see, I think one, one of the defining characteristics to me, and this isn't true in all of these, a lot of these national networks uh, don't have reporters that have, are from the community, that have reputations in the community, that used to work at the Arizona Republic or the Tennessean or the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. A lot of these places are run from uh, central offices where all the content is created, uh, that they don't, they're not grounded in the community. And that's obviously not the approach we've taken. I don't think most traditional or legacy media people want uh, to take either. I think you need reporters who are part of the community who are known entities, which I think adds to the credibility. So to me, that's one of the first clues. If you can find out who the reporters are and you can email them and you know they live in your city and they live in your state, you can talk to them on the phone. You can Facebook friend them and find out what they're working on and have input and react to their stories. That's not true for a lot of these uh, partisan outlets that pop up at the last minute. And I think we'll see at the after this election. I think we'll see a lot of these goes go away. Right. So, uh, Sue, do you, is that is that a fair characterization? You know, are we are we seeing something which will wash in and wash out with a presidential cycle, or you know, is this? Do you think there's some, something sort of more permanent here? Oh, yeah, I would agree with Chris's points entirely on that. We do suspect many of these will go away after the election, particularly where they have basic things. We've also seen there was this um, kind of boiler room approach, some of where they're just doing, uh, churning out seemingly local content or replicable content. Um, some of those may be partisan, some of them may be some people just trying to make a buck. So we're not sure. Um, so I do think there will be a scrubbing out after the election of some of these. But that said, we still have a huge vacuum in news in the US. And <laughs> maybe we'll go back, Michael, to when, when people didn't want news. But we get an awful lot of calls from communities that are just like, our local news is dying. What can we do? What's happening? So I think people do want news. And it's probably more important than it was in the 1800s because communities, people are moving around. The, the newspaper or whatever replaces the newspaper is a community tie that I suspect may be more important now than it was um, 100 or 200 years ago. So I think we'll continue to see things pop up. And I, this is just my gut based on, on nothing other than that, but I think you will see a mix of news that is, is 
more or less objective or fair or just fact-based serving a reader and more ideological publications that may be political or may be owned by um, a think tank or right. a cause. I, and, I, I, I was actually gonna I was actually gonna ask you about that because of your your mentioning of the the, the the sort of targeting of energy stories at a particular demographic and we see this over and over again with platforms which is yeah. um, for people who don't know there's a there's a particular issue with platforms uh, Facebook where a lot of people get their news uh, my understanding is you self identify as a news organization and then your um, page appears as you know th this is a news media organization um, so it's often difficult for just readers who are coming across things in their news feed and they you know look at the source of it and it says it's a news media organization but often that can, you know, that, that there's sort of lobbying money or there's corporate money behind that as much as there's political money. Um, is that something, do you, do you see, um, do organizations come to you asking to be credentialed, you know, in the INN who have that kind of yeah. thing? We, we get a lot of that. Um, and it, it's, that wasn't true five years ago. It's become a huge issue for us in sorting it through. And often they're all, I would say, I, I don't think we hear from a whole lot of operatives, you know, who are um, trying to pull something off, but we hear from a lot of well-intentioned people saying, we hire good journalists. We just, we think this is, or it will come out of solutions journalism into really advocacy without that kind of rigorous reporting behind it. So they say, we're just going to highlight these solutions and these people and these issues. And that's where it gets to the consumer. Do they know they're only going to highlight these and not address? And it doesn't have to be he said, she said journalism, but there's clearly right. uh, a cause involved in that. And we'll say that's cause communications, which is a noble and perfectly ethical thing to do. But it's different to me than journalism. The, to me, the intent matters. And if your intent is to serve the public and give them the information to make their own decision, that's profoundly different where, than where your intent is to persuade or advance a cause. And so, as long as you're clear about that, I think it's okay. Right. I, I, I'm going to ask Michael um, how we should think about this in a, in a world, you know, where, where perhaps at one time um, it's very sort of against, if you like, the, the, the kind of constitutional <laughs> outlook to try and bound what is news or, you know, what, what, what we should see as news organizations but as we have this new phenomenon of um kind of everything presenting if you like all, all with the ability for everything including um causes uh corporate money political money to present as news and it's very difficult then for audiences perhaps to parse whether that is news or not what, how should we think about that in the sort of a, in, in a sociological framework? Should we just sort of say, well, you know, kind of it's, it's about public education or are there boundaries or credentialing that perhaps, you know, organizations like SUS, you know, they draw boundaries, platforms draw fewer boundaries. How can we think about this? Uh, not, not easily, I think is the answer. Um, uh, yes, it, we're, we're a distinctive First Amendment government, keep, keep its hands off country, um, keep its hands off the media. Uh, and mostly that's the practice. Um, our, you don't have to be licensed to be a journalist. Um, and, uh, but, but there are things that complicate that um, in, in this discussion. Um, uh, tax exempt status um, complicates that. Uh, you either qualify to be a 501c3 or you don't. Um, and um, th th that matters and there's certain things you have to follow. The, the, the other thing that I, in my mind, that complicates this is um, that there is a difference between um, not being a professional journalist and being a professional journalist. Um, uh, and I don't think the public understands that. I, I, I think that's a hard thing to grasp. And 
do you need a college degree? Well, most journalists have college degrees, but they don't have to have them. Uh, do they have to have majored in journalism? No, they could have majored in chemistry. Um, and, uh, that those and and they are ordinarily committed uh, as as professional journalists to telling the truth um, and not folk, not necessarily supporting a cause though they may support a cause um, uh, the the seriousness with which professional journalists take telling the truth seems to me um, uh, not really publicly understood, and I think, and I don't know how to change that. I don't know how to make that clear. I'm just got, Sue is going to have to leave us. So I just want to ask her very quickly before she goes. <laughs> just one thing: if there's one thing that we could improve about this, what would it be? Yeah, um, it's a good question, and I think Michael just put his finger on it. Journalists tend to put out the the news and say it speaks for itself, and we should be behind it, and increasingly. Um, news literacy is a separate thing and it's like making the public take medicine, right? You need to take this on, take this responsibility. As journalists, we can weave a lot of this in if we are more transparent about putting up our values, saying not only we have an editorial independence policy, here's what that means and why it's important. Because I think ultimately if the public comes to find media sources it trusts, you're going to get a certain part of the public going directly to those We're knowing I trust this outlet or this reporter or this person and maybe viewing these others with skepticism. In the COVID crisis, you saw a fundamental um, flip in public behavior from people just reading everything on social media and believing it to um, a really high degree of doubt about things they were seeing and didn't know about, and then traffic flooded back to um, more credible and more traditional as well as new outlets, but ones that were solid reporting. And so that tells me the public is making a distinction when it really matters. Um, that may not be true in partisan politics as we see polarization. But other than that, I think putting out there um, the values and what we stand for and letting the public decide and doing that a lot more will help. That's great. Thank you so much, Sue. And uh, if, if Chris and Michael are just okay for the next couple of minutes, um, good luck, Sue, this afternoon. We'll, uh, we'll just sort of wipe, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here with a few um, thoughts um, and questions about this as well. Somebody actually asked in the Q&A, which I think is a really good, it's a really good, good point. Um, you know, is Fox, do we think of Fox as being explicitly partisan? We discuss it as being explicitly partisan. Um, OANN, uh, you know, it's sort of almost every week we seem to have through the uh, president's Twitter feed, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of appearance or promotion of a new type of news outlet. I think it was Revolver News last week was something he was tweeting about. And, you know, I've been digging into Revolver News trying to find out who's behind it, etc. These are, you know, can we, is it, again, is it just sort of paranoid and delusional thinking on my part that this could actually really seriously become a, 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 a major issue that, that creates a barrier between audiences and, and reliable news. If we don't do something about categorization, labeling, et cetera, and, and, and whose responsibility is that? So Sue was saying disclosure, um, articulating, you know, good, good faith organizations articulate who they are more often and more clearly. Um, is there anything else we should be doing, Chris, do you think, to, to, to kind of stop that kind of fog? I mean, I agree with Sue about that. We have, we have an ethics policy that we post. We don't take any corporate money or sponsorships or underwriting. Um, I think um, the credibility of the people that we hire, I think not just us, but other organizations is really important. I mean, if somebody pops on the scene that you've never heard and never, has never been in Iowa in their life and starts writing about why you, uh, something that's happening in the Iowa legislature, it is worth finding out who that person is and, and who they work for and, what, and do they live in the community and all sorts of those things. But, you know, we do have the First Amendment, which I think is so incredibly important in our country. So that, that, that um, and Michael was pointing this out, we do have a long history of all sorts of things and people have the right to say and do whatever they want. And we're in a technological age where it's easier to amplify that point of view than it was when Thomas Paine was running off pamphlets. Um, but I do think that we're, we do have to also count on the public's intelligence 
and their ability to discern, as, as Sue mentioned, we are traffic set records during the, when the COVID uh, pandemic began. It's still unusually high because people are starved for information. I do think they trust our journalists and they turn to them. Uh, so I think we have to do all we can, but we also ultimately have to trust the news consumer and the people that they will, that, that they will seek out and rely on quality, sensible information. To me, Michael, that seems like a really high bar on a very confusing, fast moving, um, really quite I I illegible system that we, that we work within now. So, so are we being too kind of old fashioned in how we think about this? Is that in the, you know, the good will rise to the top. I'm, I'm obsessed with, you know, uh, Gresham's law and economics that says unregulated bad money always drives out good. And I feel that sometimes with speech, that's exactly what's happening in news. Um, you know, what, what, are there things that work or, or might work to clarify this apart from just individual behavior? Uh, I, th I think think there are, but you know they don't work perfectly. I mean, the, the whole um, the whole fact checking movement is uh, what it's fifteen years old uh, or so, twenty years old maybe, um, and it's it started in the U.S. It's become worldwide. Uh, it's it's I think quite powerful um, in in what it does and how it does it and um and and yet um what impact does it have i i, I don't know that it's how to measure that or if it has been you may know of, uh, uh, if it's been measured um fairly well I, but i i do know that politicians pay attention to it um and don't like being called out by fact check organizations that's so they, there, there's some kind of accountability there. Um, uh, but I think that's gonna be one of several or a handful or two handfuls of different kinds of solutions. And uh, Chris, you know, should we, I was sort of thinking about this uh, yesterday and thinking, you know, about kind of, you know, I come from the UK press where everybody is partisan <laughs> and where actually we have the, the, the complete reverse situation of sort of historically of the, 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 the American press and the, certainly in the um, 20th century where, you know, you have cable news, which is very contentious and very clearly sort of partisan. We have very partisan uh, national press, which often owned local um, chains as well. Um, you know, actually, would it matter if there was a lot more partisan money going into networks as long as they were um, employing high quality reporters? Is that something that we should, because it feels to me like that's quite likely that we may yeah, actually. It might, it, might be, it might be that we're headed to the UK model or the historical model. I don't know. I think there's still uh, a way, we're still a good ways away from that. Uh, thank goodness. I still have a, a sense of um, confidence or belief in the, that even though it's very messy at the moment, I can't think of what the alternative would be. Uh, and I mentioned, uh, you know, I do think it's media literacy. I think Sue may have mentioned that is really important. I think people should read ethics policies on websites if they're concerned about it. I think they should look into who, who, uh, who the reporters are and what the background is of the outlets and all sorts of those things. But fail, I'm not sure what else we can do other than deal with this messy situation, try to establish credible news sources that people can rely on. It might be that in 20 years or 50 years, it's a, we know we're a completely partisan news environment as the UK has long had, as the US had 200 years ago. Um, I don't know where we are now is, I, I think our problem is that we don't have enough um, quality reporting that's uh, objective and believable. And, 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 and I mean, that's the, one of the voids, what we're trying to do and lot, it's what INN affiliates are trying to do. So I think our, uh, you know, we have journalists losing their jobs every day, qualified journalists, layoffs are all over the place. Um, sadly, when we go into a state now, there are a lot of journalists who are uh, qualified journalists who want to work with us because there's, there's just the traditional media model is is hanging by a thread and we're trying to fill some of that. We can't do it all and INN can't do it all. Um, so we have to continue to work on models, but I, I still believe in the traditional, at least the U.S. traditional the c contemporary idea that we need quality objective reporting and provocative commentary, which is part of journalism. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you as well, um, just make it clear that we did invite uh, Metric Media to be on the panel um, and they declined. Uh, they don't like some of the research that we've done, which is fair enough. Um, 
but the uh, you know the, so 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 for instance, metric media is an interesting one because it, it has produced a lot of stories um, under generic you know generic stories under specific geographic titles. But now it's actually moving into buying up um, you know kind of newspapers that have uh, histories and communities attached to them. Um, so 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 when we see something like that, you know ha again. Chris, how, how, should, how should we think about the metric media model? Maybe, maybe it's right. Maybe we just don't understand fully how the model of the news business is going to work oh. and perhaps it's necessary to do that. I, yeah, I, cer I certainly don't have all the answers, but a metric media is just, uh, you know, is that the latest wave of, you know, Sinclair Broadcasting has been around for quite a while. Right. Um, there, are there are newspaper chains that have histories of being very conservative or very liberal that people know about. I mean, that's already been happening. I'm not sure that it's new to the uh, maybe the the edginess or the degree of partisanship or ideology is different, but I sort of this has happened off and on, and I um, it'll be interesting to see what we do in the post sort of the post Trump era as all this if it settles down or is this something uh, that'll happen. The other alternative somebody mentioned early on, maybe it was Sue about making money off of these things. Some of these things aren't aren't designed by ideology at all. They're designed to to make money or be bought out by other uh, publications. Um, we didn't even talk today, and I know you, I'm sure you guys have talked more about this, the, the hedge funds buying out traditional right. medias and what that means for the future of journalism. So, you know, we've, we, everybody's been saying journalism is at a crossroads, but we've been here for quite a while. Um, <laughs> and we're trying, we're still trying to figure out where the road leads. Right. Yes, we're, we're, we're stuck at a crossroads and the um, traffic signals don't seem to be functioning um, at <laughs> the moment. That's right. <laughs> so we are sort of, we are kind of pretty much up to time, but I just want to ask both of you before we go, um, you know, again, I just want to return very briefly to uh, how new distribution mechanisms categorize news. And, you know, Google News has a Google News tab, which labels things as news. Facebook has a news publisher tag. Um, and again, we ask the platforms to come on and discuss that because I think that that's incredibly important in terms of how these things are presented. Um, is there a sort of, you know, it, you, you've both talked about um, literacy residing, you know, with the individuals. Is there something where, you know, kind of platforms have just taken that view, the sort of, if you like, informed by the f First Amendment, to be as wide as possible in that category? Um, Michael, you said, you know, actually, it doesn't really matter who is a professional journalist and who isn't. Um, is it too late to put the genie back in the bottle? Or should we, should we be asking the big systems of distribution to think a little bit more carefully about categorization? Um, this is not an area where I'm an expert, but, I, but it, a reader uh, should be able to know or find out easily where this news comes from um, and what it is we know about that news source. Um, is it from Fox? Is it from the New York Times? Is it from CNN? It, what, um, it, uh, and in, any intelligent news consumer knows that it makes a difference and, the, and reads the story in a different way. The story might be useful from whatever, any of those sources, but um, um, it, you know, if, if, if you have um, three friends who, who recommend restaurants to you, um, it, it makes a difference whether one is a vegetarian um, uh, and hates the steakhouse uh, or one is a steak eater who hates the steakhouse. I mean that, it, 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 and here with, with news, it makes a big public difference. Chris? Should we be leaving on the platforms to help us um, navigate through this a little bit harder? Well, it's interesting when you think about the platforms that they're, you know, they publish news, but they don't produce news. So the question is, are they responsible for the content that we are certainly responsible and have legal, uh, you know, um, uh, ramifications if we publish something that is uh, libelous or whatever the case may be incorrect. And it's interesting that oftentimes those networks are not. Um, and I think, I, I think we're going to see more discussion of that in the in the coming years, especially in this era of misinformation around something so simple as protecting your life from a deadly pandemic. I think that will be a, a, a jump start maybe to getting, and it already has been in some ways, but it's mostly been self-regulated, but it would be interesting to see what happens with those networks. But I do want to go back. I do think that the, the people, it, when 
news from the community, from people in the community, I think is one of the few things that we can sort of, uh, as a baseline, start out as. I mean, if you're if folks live there, are familiar with it, you have know them or see them, or they live in your town or your state, I think it goes a long way. Uh, instead of some, you know, some out-of-state conglomerate producing the news from New York and publishing it, um, it's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of struggles we have. But that's one baseline I think that readers can count on. Um, we are up to time. Um, I just really want to thank Michael and Chris and Sue uh, for a really fascinating conversation. I kind of, again, uh, with uh, everything in this series, I feel like we've we've we really explored the 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 tip of a very important iceberg. Um, and uh, but but it's interesting uh, with with Chris's last point there about. Uh, you know, funding models and regulation, etc. We go right back to our first seminar where we were talking about um, how do we even really know how to evaluate or count news on the ground. I think that throughout all of our uh, discussions, um, we've really sort of come come to the conclusion that there just isn't enough high quality reporting. We kind of know that. Um, and now, you know, what are the mechanisms that might um, improve that? Uh, and also, you know, what are the countervailing forces that may appear in the market, um, like, you know, political interests uh, that might shape that in the future? Um, I want to thank everybody who's attended the seminars. I really want to thank the team at TAO, um, particularly uh, uh, for this local series, Sarah Rafsky and Sam Ford and uh, Hannah Joy. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for everyone who's attended and your engagement. Um, if you have, uh, if you want to follow us, we're at uh, Tau Center on uh, Twitter. Sign up for our emails. You'll get um, links to the recordings of these sessions and uh, a newsletter which covers these issues in more depth. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to the thank audience. You. Um, and look forward to seeing uh, uh, how this, uh, how these fascinating issues unfold and how